Hello and welcome. I'm Adele Gautier from Breast Cancer Foundation New Zealand and tonight we're talking about being newly diagnosed with breast cancer. Before we get started, some housekeeping. I encourage you to make the most of the chat box. At the bottom of your screen you'll see a task bar or status bar. If you can't see it, you might have to move your cursor down to that area to make it appear. On that bar you'll see a chat icon. Click on that to open the chat box. If you have any technical issues, you can type details there and our support team will be in touch. You can use the chat box during the webinar to ask questions, which we'll get to later, get to later. And you can also chat to other people there. Don't worry about missing out on information while you're chatting. The webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website tomorrow. Right now, you should be able to see us panelists in a small box on your screen. If you want to make us bigger, just drag the corner of that box out for some reason if you want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so tonight, we're talking about what you need to know when you're newly diagnosed with breast cancer. If that's you, we're so sorry for what you're having to go through. And we hope that tonight will help you process the conversations you're having with your medical team and give you some ideas for how to handle your diagnosis and what lies ahead your way. We have three speakers tonight who will share with us. First, we'll hear from Adele, diagnosed with breast cancer last year. Then we have Dr. Aletha Taylor and Nurse Kath Taylor, who, as far as I know, are not related no. <laughs> to each other. So, Adele, you've um, gone through quite an, I'm sure, unexpected journey with breast cancer at, at a young age. Tell us about that and about what helped you to get through. Okay, so my story started last July. Um, I I just got married um, and we're about to go on a honeymoon and start trying for a baby um, and then I found a lump. Um, and I went to the GP the very next day and had a scan the very next day. Um, and during that scan, um, we were I was told that um, it didn't look good. Um, and so then, um, kind of, that was the first, like, uh, you like, panic moment I guess and we had the Saturday and su Sunday of a really like an anxious time waiting for um to see my GP to find out um what what her thoughts were um and she also agreed it didn't look good and then I had an ultrasound and a mammogram that day and met um who had become my breast surgeon um who confirmed it didn't look good and then the Wednesday I had the biopsy and then Friday um I was confirmed um diagnosed with um grade three stage two triple cos positive um breast cancer um so I think that that first week was really hard. There's no other way of um, caging that. And um, we, we didn't really tell anyone. We just kind of hung out by ourselves, went for long walks. Um, we did what we could to um, kind of process it ourselves. And then from that Friday, um, we told people. Um, we told our friends and family separately, um, in part because I, I think my husband needed a different conversation than what I needed. Um, and so we told them, and um, mostly by phone or Skype, uh, and then we got really drunk, um, all honestly. <laughs> uh, and in part because on the Monday following, we started IVF. Um, <laughs> uh, and so the, the next two weeks, um, as I'm sure you might be experiencing, it's just a sea of appointments and tests that go with being diagnosed with cancer. And on the other side, also going through IVF um, in, in my world. So um, we, again, did what we could to help cope. Um, I got a lot of flowers, of course, um, and I went to the gym quite a lot. Um, I knew that I'd be starting chemo in, in a few weeks after that, and I really wanted to feel strong going into that. Mm. Um, and I, we also, um, I wanted to control the communications a little bit, so I started, I sent out monthly emails, which I started um, that week. Uh, to kind of let everyone know and to kind of mm -hmm. tell them what I needed, uh, including that um, I didn't really want to talk about it, um, but my husband would be on comms, which, to be fair, he hated by the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> he was manning a lot of comms. He got sick of talking about me and my cancer. Yeah. But um, so we then, I then started chemo. Um, well, so we did make some embryos and then started chemo. Um, and for me, like, uh, I remember first day of chemo, like, I'd Googled everything about chemotherapy and I had a backpack. My husband had a backpack and <laughs> went along and by the ne next one we had a pack of cards and some treats for the nurses and it was a lot more of a um, relaxed vibe than I thought it would be and chemo itself wasn't as scary as I thought it would be um, and there was a, a pill for everything, just FYI. Um, and so uh, 
so I guess it's one thing just to know that sometimes the, um, uh, the reality, uh, what you imagine is a lot worse than what the reality is and you do adapt to um, what's happening. Uh, so um, I guess I did shave my head uh, and I did find a wig, it took a very long time um, and I was on Zolidex, um, it put me into menopause so I um, started having some hot flushes uh, and the point around Instagram is that it was also my way of telling my own story was um, and to connect with people and to show people that I was still okay was um, by controlling the narrative and by being able to post that way. Um, so I mean those were the first like the first time and then my uh, first few first weeks and then um, I carried on with chemo. I finished um, end of November and then I had a single mastectomy um, and an implant uh, in December. Uh, and then um, I had her septum up until September of this year and I had my port removed only about two weeks ago. Um, and I'm currently on um, hormone blockers um, for five years. Uh, and I'm happy and I'm healthy um, and I am enjoying life and um, whatever stage you're at, um, for me, I, uh, it, it feels like it was a bit of a blip for me um, and um, so all of the roller coaster that was there, um, I'm feeling pretty good now. Um, so just some things that helped me, and this is really personal to me, so, um, but having someone with me at appointments, um, particularly in the early days, it's information overload and it's really, really scary. And so, mm -hmm. and it's medical jargon. Um, and so um, whether it was recording the conversation or my husband taking notes, it was really helpful. Um, I shared what was important to me. My entire medical team knew that having a baby was important to me. And so then they would refer to it without, um, without prompting and that was, um, it became important to them. Um, Seek out all the information that you want and ask all the questions. Like I know it feels like things can be rushed um, and your medical team might be rushed, but um, ask for the questions, get all the information you want um, and make sure that, you, that you're that you comfortable with what you know. Um, and be your own health advocate if you do need more information or um, you don't understand anything. Uh, I had um, new adjuvant um, treatment, so I mean I had chemo before surgery, so I mean I had a lot of time um, to think about surgery um, and what that meant is and for me, it would have helped if I had my surgical options um, available ASAP um, and knowing what was available to me and why it was available or why not, um, because I worked myself in a little tizzy thinking that I could have all these options to available you and actually I didn't in the end. Um, and so uh, it's good to know what your options are um, up front. Um, a really important one for me was realizing that every cancer, everybody and every treatment is different and it's really don't compare, um, especially if you are in the likes of um, like the online forums or you're Googling a lot, which is also something you shouldn't do, uh, is that um, just don't compare with other people because it is um, specific, um, including the side effects. Like I, I didn't have a lot of side effects that someone else had and vice versa. And so I just don't assume everything will be the same. Um, controlling what I could um, to help me mentally and to keep living. Um, chemo gave me, chemo, I, I was a consultant and I stopped working for the most part because um, I had chemo fog. Um, and so I really lost the purpose of my day and so I needed to find structure and um, kind of get out of the house sometimes. And so I put in various steps and sought the help of friends and family to kind of help me do that. Um, I kept exercising. Um, I used to climb Mount Eden um, for every chemo and most days and um, sometimes I was really slow and like an old man shuffle going on but <laughs> other times I was powering up there and um, felt really good and so um, but it was important for me to keep being active um, stopping googling, googling which I mentioned a few times um, <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun I know I um, might not feel like that sometimes but um, there's a lot of kindness out there um, whether it's the people you meet on the oncology world or in the um, post-surgery um, your friends your family people who come out of the past um, and just generally doing things like I still went to gigs, I still went to parties. Um, I, you know, I just adapted and changed, or sometimes stayed home. But I still, I still kept on living, and I still felt like me. Mm. Um, for me, it was really important to have someone like me I could talk to or relate to. Um, so I went online a bit. Um, I found some people in the states and the UK that kind of seemed to have a similar approach to life or lifestyle that um, I felt I could relate to. Um, the You, Me and Big C podcast, I used to listen to that quite a lot, um, quite helpful listening to other people going through the same things. And my um, oncologist sent me out with a date on, a, on another patient and she's not a good friend of mine, so um, <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> um, so also what helped me was asking questions online and via the helpline. Um, uh, the helpline, particularly for oncology, was just to help with the 
the side effects to, or to know if something might need checking out. Like um, I wasn't an expert and I was never going to be an expert and something that didn't feel right. It was always important for me to check it out. I'm taking the pills and following the instructions. Um, they're there for a reason and um, there's years and years of science that can help you. Um, support for my loved ones. Uh, my husband's, um, what was going on with him was really um, hard for me to know that I couldn't take away um, his pain or his fears. And um, so what a lot of people asked me how they could help, I was like, well, can you take my husband out for a beer? <laughs> and so that was, that was my priority. Um, and support for my parents and my um, some friends. And it does, like, some people find it harder to cope um, and they might have their own things going on mentally or they might have a history of cancer. Um, and so I think don't expect everything from everyone and kind of work out who can help you um, and, like, be okay with that. Um, and for me, also not having my mum around too much because she made me feel like a patient. Um, like, so... Um, while it was probably good for her to be to see me regularly, I I, I couldn't let her in the house too often. <laughs> um, I think it also helped me to accept that I had cancer. I I think I struggled for that a bit. Like I really wanted to keep on working. Um, I really fought against the fact that um, our finances were being drained. Um, I wanted to. I struggled with the imp like we cancelled our honeymoon and like. But I think once I actually accepted I had cancer and that. Um, I was going to be on the couch a bit more and that um, I was ill and that um, for me it was just going to be temporary that um, uh, I um, kind of embraced it. I embraced being a lady of leisure and like like having a different sort of routine in my life. Um, but ultimately um, what helped me, well other than treatment, uh, was time. Uh, like um, time does heal in some ways, excuse the cliche, but um, what might have been a bad day um, the next day wouldn't be so bad. Um, what might have been um, post-surgery recovery, in the midst of it, um, two weeks later I was feeling fine. So it's kind of always remembering that it, it's bad in that moment, but it may not always be that way. Mm -hmm. um, so just some smiling photos for you. <laughs> um, some of these are like, obviously there's head shave going on there. The bubbles is uh, uh, the day before I started chemo and the... Um, that's my husband up looking into the sun. That was one of our walks between chemo. Um, those are me um, on on holding up how many chemos I had to go. Some more mm -hmm. flowers uh, post surgery. Um, that little bag I've got there is my drains, um, which I highly recommend getting some good bags and some good bras. Uh, I had a boob off party before I had um, my boob taken off. Um, and that middle photo is me um, post surgery, feeling really really happy to know that that cancer has um, gone. Um, it's a really amazing feeling. feeling and I was obviously a little bit high, but um, <laughs> no, it, was, it was good. <laughs> it was good to know it's over. So I just, um, to finish up, I just want, I mean, I'm really sorry you're here. Um, no one wants to be part of this club and it sucks. It really does. Um, but for me, the idea of it, um, particularly those early days when you're processing it all and you're imagining it all, um, but the idea of it is, um, is way worse is, um, than the actual reality of what it was. There was more bad days and bad moments um, in anything or consume or consuming and there was a lot of good um in various ways and whatever was going on i just adapted and i carried on and which is kind of what you you do when you when you just want to get better mm -hmm. um and time passed and i recovered and um throughout the treatment um i genuinely still felt like me which was um, pretty amazing i feel like clapping thanks <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 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 Thank you yeah. very much, Adele. That really was Welcome. amazing. I think <laughs> that would have been really encouraging for people at home there. Um, if you are at home, don't forget to use the chat box to ask any questions that you want or, or to talk to others who are here tonight too. Now we're going to hear from Dr. Aletha Taylor. She's an oncoplastic breast surgeon at Auckland City Hospital and at Breast Associates. Aletha, you're often in this situation talking to people newly diagnosed with breast cancer. What, what do you think they need to know? Firstly, thank you both Adele's. But <laughs> how, do, how do you follow on from, from that um, really as, as a surgeon? But um, I have these conversations probably most days of the week if I'm not operating on the people that I've been having these conversations with. Um, and I think... It's one of the great things about breast cancer management these days is that there are so many options. 
Um, but it's also one of the most overwhelming things because there are so many options. And it can be a really complicated and nuanced discussion to figure out what the right approach is for any woman uh, or men. Um, and there are different, there are, can be pretty subtle differences and in indications and reasons for, for different people. Um, and so I'm going to, in a very short space of time, try and cover some of the broader com concepts to kind of hopefully provide a bit of clarity about why people are making some of the recommendations they're making for you. So <clears throat> after a breast cancer diagnosis and that first conversation and consultation with your specialist, there's a lot going on. Um, and often that conversation focuses around surgery and what the options are and what things might tie into the different decisions that you'd be making. And for a lot of women in this discussion as well, we might be talking about other treatments first, like chemotherapy, so a neoadjuvant approach. Um, and then following that treatment, you'll be talking about pathology or what things look like under the microscope and talking about a little bit about what that means. And then covering a little bit about extra treatments, be that radiotherapy or systemic treatment, be it standard chemotherapy or some of the other drug treatment options. So if we focus on surgery in the first, um, first instance, basically the focus of an operation is to get rid of the cancer and to get more information to help guide treatments um, and give as much information as you can to a woman about prognosis or outlook and what this means going forward. Because the vast majority of women in New Zealand will survive their breast cancer diagnosis and for a very long time. Um, and I like to separate that out into two components. So we have to do an operation on the lymph nodes and we need to do an operation on the breast. Um, and I tend to talk about them separately um, because although it happens in the same surgery for most people, I think conceptually talking about them a bit separately is, is a useful thing to do. Most women will probably have a sentinel node biopsy. And so what that is, is a targeted biopsy of the lymph nodes. So the sentinel node is the first lymph node that, any can that drains the part of the breast where the cancer is. And so you can specifically look at that one or two lymph nodes to see if there's any cancer cells there. And if there isn't, then you can be very comfortable that there are unlikely to be any cancer cells in any of the other lymph nodes. So most, well, pretty much all women that are having surgery for an invasive cancer will need some form of node biopsy. And for most women, it will be a central node biopsy. And any woman having a mastectomy for DCIS will generally need a node biopsy um, because we don't want, we want to make sure we haven't lost the opportunity to find about, out about those lymph nodes at that first surgery. Um, ALLND stands for an auxiliary lymph node dissection. And that's taking out a pocket of fat containing a whole lot of lymph nodes. Um, doing that operation, I've removed between nine and 42 lymph nodes. Um, different people have different numbers of lymph nodes and the average is about 15. Um, we tend to remove, um, reserve a lymph node dissection for women that have confirmed lymph node disease, um, either, bef um, either before any surgery or after a central node biopsy. At this day and age, because we've got these two main options for operating on the breast, we've either got breast conservation or mastectomy, um, you know, we try to conserve the breast where we can. Now, basically, partial mastectomy, lumpectomy, wide local excision, they're just different names for the same thing. And it, it's about taking the cancer out from the breast with a cuff of normal tissue around it and following it up with radiotherapy. The radiotherapy is really important because if you leave the radiotherapy out, the chances of what we call local recurrence or problems in the breast are too high. Um, and the reason we'd look at doing a partial mastectomy is whatever we do, we've got to treat the cancer properly. But if we can do that and leave a woman with as cosmetically acceptable breast as possible, then that's going to be a good thing. Um, and so for some women, it's not technically possible due to the size of their cancer or the pattern of the cancer. And for some women, it's not something they'd want. They'd be worried about the remaining breast tissue, even if I say to them it's a really safe thing to do. There's a lot of really good studies that compare partial mastectomy and radiotherapy with mastectomy with very long-term follow-up that have shown for the vast majority of women it's a very safe thing to do. 
in certain situations, particularly with younger women or women who have a higher genetic risk of developing breast cancers, things like BRCA gene mutations, there's a, there, are, there might be reasons from a recurrence perspective that you wouldn't want to be thinking about doing a partial mastectomy. Um, in different places around the country, surgeons are using these things called oncoplastic techniques, which is basically us stealing some of this, the skills and tools of the plastic surgeons to like some reduction techniques to make partial mastectomies an option where they wouldn't have previously been for some women. And sometimes having treatment like chemotherapy or neoadjuvant treatment can make breast conservation a possibility, and I'll talk a little bit more about that going forward. If we're thinking about mastectomy, so broadly speaking, that's removing the whole breast, and it can be done in a whole lot of different ways. You can do a simple mastectomy, so just remove the breast and leave the woman with a flat chest wall with an external prosthesis, or you can look at doing an immediate reconstruction where you remove the breast and leave the skin behind, and sometimes you can leave the skin and nipple behind and follow that up and fill that with some form of reconstruction. And there's a whole lot of different options around the kinds of reconstruction. Um, depending on the situation on the woman, on the cancer, on the different treatments planned, you might want to be thinking about doing a reconstruction at the same stage or an immediate reconstruction, or you might want to be having a, a discussion about a reconstruction in a later phase, or for some women, they might not want to have a reconstruction at all, and that's okay. Um, it's a pretty nuanced discussion, and I think it's really something that needs to be had for individuals on an individual level with your specialists in terms of what is right for you. Um, the other thing that often comes up with a breast cancer diagnosis is, is the concept of having one breast off or both breasts off. And the reality is for most women, there isn't a medical need to consider bilateral mastectomies. And so I often counsel women to take a pause and have a breath because it's a lot easier to remove a breast than it is to put one back on. <laughs> um, and it, the ones we put back on are not yours and they won't feel the same and they probably won't look the same, but they certainly won't feel the same. <coughs> so having gone through all of those discussions and, and decisions around sur surgery, for someone, I said before, some women we might think about giving chemotherapy first. So if you've got a woman that you know before in the early consultations that you're going to be talking about chemotherapy, there can be reasons that you might want to think about giving that first. And that can have different goals. It can be around changing the kind of surgery that you might be able to do. It can be around coordinating things like genetics assessments. It can be looking at response to treatments and seeing if you can get something called a complete pathological response, or it can be around coordinating timeframes and organizing reconstructions and giving women time to get their head around the decision. So there's lots of different reasons that you might want to consider that approach if it's, a, if it's appropriate for you. Um, after surgery, we generally sit down and have a talk about the pathology or the lab results. And the factors up on the slide are all the things that we go through when we're talking about a cancer. And they're important because they're all different bits of the jigsaw puzzle that talk to risk going forward and talk to benefits of different types of treatment. And the things we're particularly interested in are the size. The grade is one of the first markers that we've got to give us an idea of aggression. Um, and it's often confused with stage. When you're having your first appointment, you're normally told the you, you can be told the grade of the cancer, and there's three different grades of cancers. There are four separate stages, and I know that a lot of a lot of people get confused between the two. <laughs> to find out the stage, we need to know the overall size of the cancer. We need to know all the information about the lymph nodes, and we need to know if there's any signs of spread. So that's information we often get a little bit later. Um, Lymphovascular invasion is in and around the cancer, there are little blood vessels and lymphatics, and whether or not there are any cancer cells going into those lymphatics can be a, a marker of aggression. Um, and then obviously there's a receptor profile looking at estrogen and progesterone receptors and, and HER2, which is a growth factor, which are all important in help, helping personalize treatment going forward. Um, so the extra treatment we're thinking about broadly falls into radiotherapy or treatment of the local area. Um, and the goal of radiotherapy is to reduce the risk of local recurrence. 
So every woman who has a partial mastectomy for a breast cancer and a, most women having a partial mastectomy for DCIS will be talking about radiotherapy. Um, and some women who've had a mastectomy but have features of their cancer that suggest a higher risk of recurrence will be recommended radiotherapy. Traditionally, radiotherapy was given to the whole breast over five days for five weeks. Most women these days have what we call hyperfractionated radiation, which is the same dose but compressed into a, a three-week period. Um, and although not commonly used, I think one of the things we're going to be seeing going forward is only having partial breast radiotherapy, so just treatment localised to the part of the breast where the cancer was. Um, and then there's talk around systemic treatment. And so that's basically drug treatment. Now, some women won't need any drug treatment. Some women will need all the drug treatments that are listed there, and some women might need only a few, depending on the features around their, their cancer. So chemotherapy is, when I talk about that, what we're talking about is cytotoxic chemotherapy, so cell killing, and it's um, and that's the stuff people think about in terms of losing their hair and feeling sick and, and diarrhea and those type of side effects. Targeted therapy are things that are looking at specifically at features of the cancer cell that might respond to treatment. And in the breast cancer space, we're talking about things like Herceptin and Pertuzumab targeting that HER2 receptor. And then because breast tissue comes from breast cells, a lot of breast cancers will have receptors that respond to hormones. And so endocrine therapy is like the anti-HRT, it's blocking the effect of those hormones to get benefits in terms of reducing recurrence and problems. So things like tamoxifen and letrozole and um, aromidex. Right. So a lot to cover. We tend to go for it a little more slowly. <laughs> that was a lot to get through. Um, hopefully that made sense to you at home. Um, if not, do feel free to ask a question in the chat box and we'll come to that later. Um, now we're going to hear from Nurse Catherine Taylor. She's a breast care nurse at Middlemore Hospital. Um, Kath, we often hear from patients that their nurse made all the difference to them when they were going through breast cancer treatment. What do you do and what's your advice for... Well, thank you, there? Adele. I'd actually like to say that I think it's a privilege being able to look after people, like look after women and men um, through their cancer treatment. And um, I love your story, Adele. Thank you. <laughs> I'm always impressed by how strong people are and how well they cope. And I think people do cope better than they imagine they're going to. Um, I'm at Counties Manukau in South Auckland and we're a large breast service and we diagnose over 400 breast cancers a year. Um, men do get breast cancer too, and this year we've diagnosed four men, so I know a lot of that information feels like it's aimed at women, but um, men are on my mind at the moment. We're your contact person, we're your contact team, we clarify questions, we liaise with your medical team, we advocate on your behalf, um, we do practical things, making sure you get your treatments, your scans, your surgery on time. Um, so please work out who your medical team is, um, work out who your contact person is, so you can call them, you can email them, um, they can answer what you need to know. Discovering you have cancer, um, it's a shock, it's overwhelming um, and it's difficult to take it all in. I think during that first week, like Adele said, um, you can go through a whole range of emotions and women do talk about a roller coaster. Um, they can feel in control and positive and hopeful, um, but within the hour, within that day, or sometime during that week, they can go through a whole range of um, emotions from despair to disbelief, anger, distress. Now you may feel isolated, you may feel very scared, and a lot of people tell us that they feel like their life is sort of um, They've lost control for a while. At this point, people often wonder if they're going to die. And I think it's important to remember that in reality, most people survive breast cancer. Um, it's important to remember that you've got a great medical team behind you, you know, a great team of experts that can look after you physically and emotionally. Um, and there's also lots of effective treatment, just like Aletha has been talking about. It's also important to remember that these emotions, they will they'll start to settle down. Um, they will improve, you will adjust, and you will cope. But what you'll need to do is give yourself time, and you need support. I don't think anybody 
um, would be able to get through cancer treatment alone. People often ask, why me at this stage? There seems to be a lack of knowledge about what caused the cancer. And people often think of behaviors in their past that they think may have caused the cancer. Um, it's probably not your fault. You know, the development of cancer is very complex. And I think maybe it's best to focus all your energies on things you can control, you know, things you can change, and that's getting ready for treatment um, and coping with treatment. A hard call is who do you tell and when do you tell? Um, this is completely up to you. You can choose to be as private as you want. You know, you choose who you tell, when you tell, and in what ways you want to tell people. Some people choose to tell everybody and they gain great strength from that. And others choose not to tell very many people at all. When you do tell, keep it simple and be prepared for tears and also be prepared to comfort them. Yeah, they'll be shocked, they'll be in disbelief. Um, you'll have different levels of friendships and for different people you may want to tell in different ways. Some people you'll want to tell face to face. Um, others, you may want to email, text, Facebook. It's up to you. Um, very soon you'll discover who can support you and who can't. So be pleasantly surprised when someone comes out of the work, woodwork who you hadn't prepared to support you. Um, and also be prepared to be disappointed that somebody who you thought would be there for you, they can't be there. You know, people are paralyzed by cancer sometimes and they don't know what to say and they don't know what to do for you. Um, the more open you are, sometimes it's the easier for people to support you. Uh, a cancer diagnosis affects your partner and it sends ripples around your family and friends. Now your partner will be shocked. Um, they will also um, could be feeling hopeless. They could be feeling isolated. They're trying to cope with their own response while trying to be, help you with yours. And again, sometimes they don't know what to say or what to do. You'll need to guide them, you'll need to talk. Um, if your partner's a man, I always think men are traditionally protectors. Um, they love fixing jobs. And suddenly they are faced with a challenge that they can't fix. Um, so just like you, they need time, they need um, support. So please be kind to each other, keep talking, keep working this out together. As parents, our natural instinct is to protect our kids from worry and distress. But I think the best thing you can do is talk to them quickly and, and be as honest as you can. I know cancer is a scary word, but I think sometimes the more you say it, um, I hope it gets easier. Children are intuitive. They know what's going on in the home. They listen to whispers, they watch your face. They're also egocentric. They'll want to know how the cancer affects them. You know, who is going to pick me up from school? And can I stay for my par party? And can Joe come over and play? Um, kids are resilient. They will cope better than you imagine. But again, they'll want time and they'll want support. Um, the way you tell your children and how you tell them will depend on the age of your children. So I think, you know, you know your kids. You know how you tell them. Um, but young children will need reassurance that they haven't caused the cancer. And just be aware of teenage children. We all know about the, um, the very quiet teenage boy and perhaps the more emotional and anxious teenage girl. Encourage questions. You won't have all the answers and there's nothing wrong in saying that. You know, keep them informed as things change, but reassure them about ongoing love, you know, ongoing stability. Keep up all your family routines. And like Adele said, have some fun. You, know, you can't have doom and gloom cancer all the time. Keep up routines, keep up your limits, and let the school and childcare know. Um, ask them to tell you if there's a change in your child's behaviour. Um, it can be very uncomfortable telling your boss that you have breast cancer. But again, you decide how private you want to be and what you want to tell them. But I think you do need a discussion about time off work. Um, financially, how you'll pay for that time off work. Is it sick leave? Is it unpaid leave? Is it um, flexi hours, light duties? There may be lots of uncertainties about how you'll feel, how much time you'll want off, and how you'll cope with your treatments. So keep your boss, your manager informed, because um, things may keep on changing. 
Um, a lot of people do work through their cancer treatment um, because you're a healthy person to start with. You know, you're, you're starting from the right place. A lot of employers ask for letters of um, proof these days. So please um, talk to your medical team, talk to a breast care nurse. Um, and be kind to yourself when you're thinking about going back to work. I think physically people recover really quickly. Um, emotionally it takes longer. So nobody thanks you for going back early. Um, so just look after yourself first. We give heaps of information. Like Adele said, <laughs> we give you so much information. It is overwhelming. <laughs> um, information can keep you in control and can keep you calm. It can keep those emotions in check, but you only remember half of it. You know, if not even maybe a quarter of it. Um, it'll take time to absorb all that information. Um, and sometimes information doesn't make sense until you're further down your cancer treatment. Um, so think about what you need to know. You know, how much do you want to know? Some people want to know very little. Some people um, want to know all the gory details. When you go to appointments, write down your questions, and then we know we're answering what you, is important for you. Take a support person, um, take notes, ask for reports, ask for your results. Ask for an interpreter if English um, is not your first language. And please, if you don't understand, ask questions because it's usually our fault for not explaining things properly to you. Adele mentioned Google, and I just put that up there as well. Um, <laughs> that can be so scary. <laughs> so sometimes you narrow that down. <laughs> um, and call your breast care nurse. Um, she can clarify information for you. Choosing the right treatment for you can be stressful, but please take your time. I know. Um, I know cancer is distressing, but this is not an emergency. We'd like you to take your time to make the right decision for you and to make a decision that you're comfortable with. Um, remember, it's a very personal decision that nobody else has your cancer and you don't have theirs. So stick to the facts of your cancer. Um, if you're thinking about surgery, think about what your breast means to you. Um, think about the risks and the benefits of losing a breast and talk to your partner. You know, breast surgery, breast, breast cancer um, changes the way you feel about your body. You know, it can have a huge impact on your body image. It can impact your sex life. Um, it can affect your confidence. So make a decision that is right for you as a couple um, and keep talking. Um, and please be prepared for free advice from friends. Um, people are very, very willing to give their opinion, but remember it's your cancer and it's your decision. Two things that are really hard to do, and that's to ask for help and then to accept help. Um, but think about what support you really need to get through this. I think we as friends are very good at giving lasagnas. But <laughs> if you want more than 100 lasagnas, think what would really help you get through your treatment. You know, from your families, from your friends, and also from us as professionals. Um, as breast care nurses, we can refer you to a whole range of professionals. We have a lovely cancer support team that um, with psychologists who are fabulous at getting your headspace into coping um, and into coping with uncertainties. Um, take time out. You know, cancer will dominate your thoughts for two weeks or for the first few weeks, but you can't think about it all the time. Um, do nice things. You know, if it's walking the dog, going for a walk, if it's exercise, if it's watching Netflix, do whatever makes you feel good and keeps you in control. Let your feelings out. And you know, there's nothing wrong with a damn good cry sometimes. Um, journals, writing your experience, writing your feelings, um, exercise, relaxation, um, whatever feels good for you, keep it up. Um, so finally, take your time. You know, please catch your breath. Let your emotions work themselves out. Um, no need to rush into a treatment. Be kind to yourself, ring your breast care nurse, and I, I wish you all the luck um, and all the best for your treatment. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Kathy. I think that would have been very helpful for everyone else. Yeah, just glad that commented on um, Now, before we move on to um, questions, I'm just going to speak really briefly about some of the clinical trials that are open in New Zealand at the, at the moment. Often, um, many of the clinical trials are around the drug trials that you won't hear about until later in your treatment if you're having chemo after surgery, for example. 
but at the moment there are some trials that are open for people just starting their treatment and these might be things you want to ask your surgeon or your oncologist if you're having near adjuvant treatment about. So some of these trials you might have seen in, in the media recently like Pantosin, that's to, uh, um, looking at an over-the-counter drug that can prevent delayed nausea and vomiting after chemo. Well, that's what that's the question they're asking. Can it can it um, prevent those delayed nausea and vomiting? And that's open at a large number of hospitals around New Zealand, as you'll see there. POSNOC is a trial for people with breast cancer that has gone to one or two lymph nodes, and it's comparing having drug treatment alone versus having drug treatment plus surgery or radiotherapy on their nodes. Correct me if I'm wrong with any of these, Aletha. <laughs> um, the, and that's open in four places, Auckland, Rotorua, Waikato and Kami. The expert trial looks at um, radiation therapy after for patients with stage 1 breast cancer as the normal standard of care or looking at um, observation only and not having radiation therapy. And lastly, keynote, this is a drug trial for patients having neoadjuvant treatment, patients with high risk ER positive HER2 negative breast cancer, and it's looking at the drug Keytruda being used with chemo before surgery and with hormone therapy after surgery. So talk to your doctor about that. If you want to find out more about them, they're on our website, um, breastcancerfoundation.org.nz slash clinical trials. You'll find that there. Okay, so now, thank you so much to all three of our panellists, but it's not over yet. <laughs> um, we're opening up now to um, questions from people at home, and we do have quite a few come in, so we'll just start with a few those, and I'll just farm them out between you. Um, the first question for Adele, mm -hmm. just a quick one. What's the name of that blog you mentioned that you found very helpful? Um, um, it's the You Mean the Big C mm -hmm. podcast. It's the BBC podcast, one. Sorry, yes, the um, that sorry. one. That one's really good. And you, the two of the women who run it, they're also on social media and they're connected to um, other breast cancer um, people and charities in the UK. So you can probably find other people like you by um, following the lines. Um, and there's also in these true cancer bodies, which has just started in the UK. A lot of my things I've followed was in the UK, um, and that um, it profiles different people with different types of cancer, including breast cancer. So it's another way that you could follow people. Um, if you're after people, um, you want to find people that resonate with you, then that's another way of doing it. Just Google. It's not Google. Okay. <laughs> 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 it's not treatment. Yeah. Um, Next up, uh, Elisa will give you this one. Why does lymphedema occur? That's a good one. Um, so lymphedema is swelling of the arm, obviously, and, and breast cancer because the lymph nodes that we re remove uh, drain that area. So part of the normal role of the lymphatic system is drainage of fluid from the tissues and then filtering it through the lymph nodes. And when we surgically remove those lymph nodes, we disrupt that system and make it less effective. Um, and for a lot of people, there's enough redundancy in the system that the rest of the lymphatic system can take over and deal with that fluid. But for some women, there's not, so you get arm swelling. And there can be things that increase your risk. So we know that if you need to have radiotherapy as well as surgery to the lymph nodes, your risk of lymphedema is in increased. If you have recurrent infections on that side, your risk of lymphedema is increased. Um, raised body weight, so increased BMI or obesity is associated with an increased lymphedema risk. Um, but yeah, principally around damage to a normal structure. And that can start any time? Yeah, it can start any time. Yeah. And a lifetime risk, isn't it? A lifetime risk. It is, and we try, we try and be quite... It's always very difficult to estimate the risk of lymphedema. I think some of the trials talk about a 25% risk or 20 to 25% risk. Um, but when you look at some of those studies, it's a measured difference. And I think having a difference that's that you don't notice, but if somebody came and measured your arm, it's very different from a symptomatic swelling. Mm -hmm. um, I think, although it can still happen, that really big obvious swelling of the arm that's uncomfortable, 
that you can see some photos of in the internet is far less common than it used to be. And I think one of the reasons, firstly, we're doing far less aggressive axillary ex surgery, but also I think even for the woman having axillary dissections, we're much more proactive around giving advice to reduce risk, things like compression sleeves, early management, preventive wearing sleeves to protect on, on long travel, and, very, and, and referring people early for intervention when you can. Mm. Great, okay. Uh, now, Kath, maybe this one for you. Um, we've, we've alluded a bit to the fact that everyone's different and, mm. and they um, take their treatments differently and so on. Um, so, um, and this patient says, people have been telling me that everyone's different, so side effects can differ between people. Would you, is that what you experience in your... Oh, a huge range. Day? It's a huge range. And people cope in different ways as well. Um, I think you do what makes you feel comfortable and you make what makes you feel best actually, what, you know, whatever you're going through. Mm -hmm. But genuinely, I think when people go through surgery, they feel better than they imagine. Mm -hmm. um, they recover faster, faster. It's not as painful as they imagine. Mm -hmm. um, usually they're up and walking around the next day. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, everybody is different. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and recognise that. Mm -hmm. um, Aletha, can, here's a question very specific. Can radiotherapy be delayed by 12 weeks after surgery? I'm working on the presumption that there's not going to be any other recommended treatment after surgery. And the reason I say that is if you have surgery and the recommendation is going to be chemotherapy after radiotherapy and chemotherapy if it's anything more than just hormone blocking can't be given at the same time so often that will take you to at least six months after surgery anyway if you're looking at surgery with no extra treatment going straight to radiotherapy generally we do like to start it by 12 weeks um, and part of and and that's often something I defer to the the radiation oncologist. So the first thing I would say is have a talk to your radiation radiation oncologist about pros and cons. Um, we we tend to get a little bit anxious beyond twelve weeks. A lot of that is derived from the information around the chemotherapy drugs, what we call the medical oncology literature, because the worry is that maybe after twelve weeks the benefits of radiotherapy aren't going to be as great as if it's given before. And we know that's the case for chemotherapy. It's less clear with radiotherapy, but that is one of the reasons that we have this magical 12-week mark. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, Adele, do you find that your side effects changed or worsened after each chemo treatment? Uh, it varied on the side effect. I found some ways my first chemo was the hardest because it just felt my whole body just what's this type thing and then by the, the second and the third the fourth like I, I just adapted and it wasn't as um it wasn't as bad so um and then and, it, and I think it was the first one and then the last one and then I think that's that whole cumulative effect of what it's doing to your body so I, I was a lot more tired by the last mm -hmm. one than I was um say the second one um but um, um, yeah, so it just, I think it varied. Um, Did you find that first one, you don't know what to expect? Yeah. You don't know how you're going to respond? Isn't yeah. So, so many unknowns. Isn't yeah, it? exactly. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, I mean, it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, mm -hmm. to be honest. And then, um, and it was by the second one and the third one, you know, I was, I was active, I was mm -hmm. you know, seeing people, so, um, and, it, and then it wasn't until the last one again um, where I think tired um, and I was starting to slow down on being active. But that, that's, you know, four months later. So, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of good time in there. Um, and I love the fact that you said that you exercise through chemotherapy. Yeah. Because people that exercise you usually, usually feel better. So yeah. it's a great thing. Yeah, yeah. it helped me mentally mm. um, as well as the physical side of things. Mm. Mm. I think we do sometimes hear from people who, had a worse experience maybe on the yeah. second or third mm -hmm. round and then it's settled down again. Yeah. And when you change yeah. drugs. Yes. Like, yeah. <laughs> three yeah. two different types. Um and so it's it's a new experience and then something new happening to your body. Um and so uh yeah you can, mm -hmm. you can react that way too. Mm -hmm. 
And now a question that I must admit I do not know the answer to. We have been told we should avoid eating all types of honey. We're based in Asia. Do you agree with that? Oh, I've never heard that. I've never heard that. <laughs> um, but I tell you what, um, the person who asked that question, um, Ken and, and Coyne, if you um, would like to drop us your email, we'll do some more research on that and come back to you on that one because it sounds like a, an interesting question for mm. not. So, yeah. Okay. Um, now, let's see. We've got another chemo question here, I think. Let's see. Um, I have yet, I know about radiation therapy. I have yet to have radiation therapy. It's being scheduled. The only side effect people seem to mention is extreme tiredness. Why is that? As a non radiation oncologist, it's hard <laughs> to give a definitive answer to that. But I think it's probably just your body's response to having a high energy beams and throwing at it really mm -hmm. um, and body I, having to focus on, on something else. Yeah. A lot of people um, are able to work through radiotherapy mm -hmm. yes. and it makes it more difficult in Auckland if you're travelling up and down a big motorway to get to it but um, generally people find that they actually are well, they take a couple of hours off and go back to work so I hope that happens, I hope that happens with you. Mm -hmm. Um, question about, I've, I've also had my, someone else saying, I've had my first chemo effect treatment. When will I expect to see hair loss starting? What was your experience, Adele? Uh, I did uh, fix second, um, but uh, it was about two weeks after my first chemo that it started to come out in clumps and it's a bit gross, so I shaved it out. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but it took, it took a bit of time. Yeah, it's about two to three weeks, and it's normally all at once, isn't it? You know, and sometimes for people, it's their hair on the head. For others, it's it's total hair loss, eyebrows, eyelashes, pubic hair. Um, it depends how it, how it affects you. Mm. I didn't lose my eyebrows, eyebrows and eyelashes. I was yeah. waiting for it. <laughs> 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 it's a bonus. I lost about fifty percent, but I was yeah. stoked. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And some people um, do shorter, shorter, shorter haircuts. Some uh -huh. people do the Adele way and, and, and shave. Um, some people go and get wigs first so that they're ready. When the hair does fall out, they can put the wig on straight away. Um, again, you do what you do what feels best for you. I've got a much more eloquent answer to the radiotherapy question now. I wasn't <laughs> in correct, but um, <laughs> basically, the your body's using a lot of energy to help repair the cells that are being damaged because healthy cells are being damaged as well. Um, as Kath said, some women are having to travel quite a lot of distance and that can take it out of you. And you can be stressed and anxious and not sleeping as well. Nice answer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, when I was diagnosed, I had no idea who to choose as my breast surgeon. My GP provided the recommendation. Is there any other alternative to this? <laughs> um, Look, I think a, a GP is a very good place to start because your GP knows you um, and they will have developed relationship with different specialists around the environment that you live. And it's the same as when I, I'm referring a patient to a medical oncologist. A lot of people have a very good skill set and sometimes it's about personality fit and, and the way somebody's going to explain things. So I think your GP is a very good resource. Um, the second is friends or acquaintances, somebody that you know that has gone through treatment that's had a good experience, that can be really useful as well. Um, and sometimes just how you feel because sometimes you will meet somebody and you will feel comfortable with them but if you meet somebody and you're not feeling comfortable with them, mm -hmm. it's entirely okay to ask mm -hmm. and see somebody for a second opinion. Mm -hmm. Right. And you can then change all together mm -hmm. if you decide. Um, because I say to patients when, when we're talking about second opinions that it shouldn't be about your specialist ego. All right. It should be about... And this is my personal view, it, you know, it should be about patients getting the treatment they need in the way that they need it. Mm. And if that's about seeing a different person, that's okay. And is this really only in the private 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think in the private sector, obviously, one of the benefits of the private sector is you do get to have more control over the people that you see. Um, in, the, in the public sector, I think there are different people involved in your care, but, you know, to a degree, it can be a little bit of a lottery for a want of a better term in terms of which consultant specialist clinic you turn up in, but, um, and it can depend on the environment you're in because, I work at Auckland Hospital and we're lucky enough to have five breast surgeons working in our department, but a smaller centre won't have that luxury. But I think you are entitled to say, can I, can I see a different specialist in this appointment to have a discussion about options? I think we are lucky in New Zealand though that we do have some, you know, we do have well-trained consultants yeah. across New Zealand. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're absolutely. Fortunate. We are, yeah. Um, a question, is it possible for cancer to come back following chemo and a partial mastectomy? Um, unfortunately, it's cancer. It's possible for cancer, to, breast cancer to come back after all of the treatments. Um, and so every treatment, that, and that is regardless of the type of surgery you choose, breast conservation versus mastectomy or chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And that for a lot of women is the reason, particularly the, the system, the things like chemotherapy and radiotherapy, the reason that you're having that is to reduce that as much as possible. But I think in terms of concern about recurrence or spread around the rest of the body, a lot of a lot of women think that if they haven't, if, if both a partial mastectomy and a mastectomy are options to them for treating their breast cancer, a lot of women express to me that they think if they have a mastectomy, they might be, they're treating their cancer more aggressively and they might be less likely to be recommended something like chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy recommendations and how aggressively you're treating your cancer is not dependent on the type of operation you choose on the breast for the most part. Great. And after breast conserving surgery, you'll be having yearly mammograms and that will be your best surveillance to try and pick up any um, recurrence and it'll probably pick up before you can feel it yourself. So on that subject we've had a, um, a question about um, about any tips on recurrence. We're, we're just about out of time here so I would say to that person we do have a really good webinar on fear of recurrence mm -hmm. on our website so mm -hmm. take a look at that and that there are some really good um, information there. Uh, quickly on hair, you mentioned wigs, but patients are able to purchase headwear and sun hats, hats, turbans, etc., using the Ministry of Health subsidy. So that's a really good tip to people, right. yeah, just, not just wigs. <laughs> if you don't want a wig, you can get a nice hat instead. Um, okay, I think, are we, are we just about out of time? There yeah, are. Uh, um, what is your view on aromatase inhibiting foods as estrogen blockers? I don't have a strong view on them. Right. Okay. I'm not sure what those are, so we'll leave that. Um, and I think that is it for now. If there are questions we haven't answered, we'll go through that and um, contact you with the email address that you registered for the webinar. Uh, oops, we don't have the last slide there. In that case, let me just um, close off for tonight by thanking again our speakers, Adele, Aletha, and Kat. Um, you've all been fantastic. Tomorrow, if you have more questions that we haven't got to tonight and you'd like to call a nurse, uh, call our breast nurse line 0800 BC Nurse uh, during office hours, or you can email breast nurse at breastcancerfoundation.org.nz. There's also our MyBC online uh, breast cancer community where you might have a chance of meeting people like you, um, and you can certainly talk to other patients there and hear more from them. When you finish the webinar tonight, when you exit, there'll be a link to an exit survey. And if you do have time, we'd really appreciate you filling that out for us to tell us what you think. Uh, that's it from us. Thank you very much and good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>